These are the questions that have burned inside of man for as long as we have been able to ask them. This is the operating system. A philosophic and esoteric look into the simulation hypothesis. What is this place that we are in, this thing we call reality? And where did it come from? How did it begin? When I ask you these questions and your brain starts flipping through its Rolodex of, of information and memories, looking for answers, what you see probably looks something like this. Our whole universe was in a hot, dense state that nearly 14 million years ago expansion started. Wait, the earth began to cool, the autotrophs began to drool, Neanderthals developed tools, we built a wall. We built the pyramids, math, science, history, unraveling the mystery that all started with a big bang. But why? Why is this what you see? Quite simply, it's because it is what you were taught. As science progresses and new discoveries are being made in the fields of quantum physics and astrophysics, cosmology, mathematics, genetics, it is becoming increasingly clear that this existence and its origins are a lot more complicated than the standard materialist model can explain. So what is the current scientific data actually saying? And what is it leading some of the brightest minds in science and technology to deduce about reality? And so I'm left with the puzzle of trying to figure out whether I live in the matrix or not. <laughs> Wait, you're blowing my mind at this moment. So you're saying, are you saying your attempt to understand the fundamental operations of nature leads you to a set of equations that are indistinguishable from the equations that drive search engines and browsers on yeah, our computers. That is correct. So, the wait, wait, I'm still, wait, I have to just be silent for a minute here. <laughs> so you're saying as you dig deeper, you find computer code writ in the fabric of the cosmos into the equations that we want to use to describe the cosmos, yes. Computer code. Computer code, strings of bits of ones and zeros. It's not just sort of resembles computer code, you're saying it is computer code. It's not even just is computer code, it's a special kind of computer code that was invented by a scientist named Claude Shannon in the 1940s. The more I learned about it later on as a physicist, the more struck I was that when you get deep down under the hood about how nature works, down to looking at all of you as just a, as a bunch of quarks and electrons. The and rules. you too, it's not just us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Looking at you as a quark, no, you would come under this category <laughs> yes. as well. I, I am a quark blob too, I, <laughs> okay. I, I, I confess. So, uh -huh. But if you look at how these quarks move around, you know, it's, the rules are entirely mathematical as far as we can say, Helen. And that makes, makes me wonder, if I were a character in a computer game who started asking the same kind of big questions about my game world, I would also discover eventually that the rules seemed completely rigid and mathematical. I would just be discovering the computer program in which it was written. So that kind of begs the question, how can I be sure that this mathematical reality isn't actually some kind of game or, or simulation? I personally find that I gravitate more towards the information theoretic point of view and, and believing that uh, that I'm, I, the universe that I exist in is a very good, high-quality simulation. Well, maybe we're in a simulation right now. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously. A simulation, huh? Like the Matrix? Like we're in the Matrix and it was a documentary? See, we have to think critically. We can't stubbornly hold on to what we were taught because we're afraid to be wrong or we're proud of what we know. I said things were more complicated than they wanted us to believe, but deep down you knew that was true. You knew there was something wrong with the story. Well, these modern day technological and scientific revelations are forcing us to rethink things. We now have to give credence to the idea that what we are experiencing can no longer be described as random. It may actually be best described as a virtual reality or a, a digital simulation. The analysis starts at the beginning, with the Big Bang. This well-established cosmological model demonstrates that space-time was created by a single event billions of years ago and expanded into what we see around us today. Nearly all scientists agree that our universe began to exist at one point in the distant past. From the materialist view that our universe is all there is, as an objective, independent reality, the fact that the Big Bang came from nothing is very hard to explain. How could everything come from nothing? But if you look at the universe as a virtual construct, the Big Bang model works perfectly. Virtual worlds always begin with an information influx from a zero state, since they need to initially boot up. Every time a computer game starts up, a Big Bang occurs from the perspective of the game. From inside the virtual world itself, the creation always comes from nothing, because before it boots up, there is no space or time as defined by the rules of that virtual world. For you to come by, I was waiting, girl. Won't you please tell me why this took so long to begin? Darling, where have you been all my life? Seriously, where has this idea been all of my life? It, it answers so many questions. No longer do we have to just accept that everything came from nothing, which is the most egregious violation of the first law of thermodynamics imaginable. And not just matter, but energy, the very laws of nature, time itself, all came out of nowhere, no when and for no reason. Just think about it. When your Xbox or PlayStation or computer is off, it exists in a zero state. Then when you press the power button, there is an influx of energy from the wall outlet, which is connected to the power grid, and then the hardware triggers the software, and voila, totally immersive 3D worlds are generated. I know what you were going to say, who programmed the programmer, and then who programmed them, and this argument, this, this logic just spirals down infinitely. But the digital genesis theory actually has an answer for this. The place that if there is a computer running things, the place where the computer is doesn't have to have the same laws we have. I see. They don't need to have, be a kind of place that has beginnings and endings. Can you see what this means? For possibly the first time ever, we have a legitimate, viable explanation for the origin of our universe. The computer that is running the simulation is in a different plane of existence. And this mysterious place, whatever or wherever it is, could very well have different rules, different laws than what we have here. Therefore, the Big Bang and our consequent universe are a product of this other place and that place didn't have to have a beginning. If this concept of explaining the potential origin of our universe isn't every bit, if not more plausible to you than the standard model that you were taught, 
then unfortunately there's probably no hope for you. Your critical thinking capability has been removed entirely. Prior to observation, matter does not seem to exist. Matter seems to be the result of an interaction between consciousness and waves of potential. This has been demonstrated repeatedly in ever more precise versions of the double slit experiment from the 1920s right up through the present. To understand the double slit experiment, we first need to know how particles behave. If we shoot small objects at a detector, we will see a clump pattern form where they went through the slit and impacted. If we add a second slit, we would expect to see a second clumping duplicated to the right. Now let's look at waves. The waves go through the slit and radiate out, striking the back wall with the most intensity directly in line with the slit. The line of brightness on the back screen shows that intensity. This is similar to the clump pattern. But when we add the second slit, something different happens. When the top of one wave meets the bottom of another, they interfere and cancel each other out. This results in an interference pattern on the back wall. Where the waves reinforce each other, they are at the highest intensity, the bright lines. And where they cancel each other out, there is nothing. So, when we fire objects through two slits, we get two clump patterns. But with waves, we get an interference pattern. An electron can be seen as a very small bit of matter. And when a stream of electrons is fired through one slit, they behave like small objects, forming a single clump pattern. So if we fire these bits of matter through two slits, we should get two clump patterns. But we don't. We get an interference pattern. We fired particles through, but we get a pattern like their waves, not like little objects. How can pieces of matter create an interference pattern like waves? It doesn't make sense. At first, physicists thought that the electrons were bouncing off each other to create this interference pattern. So, in 1961, Klaus Johnson at the University of Tübingen in Germany modified the experiment to fire the electrons through one at a time. This way, there is no possibility of them bumping into and interfering with each other. But, again, the interference pattern was seen. Physicists were perplexed by this. It somehow seems to have been aware of there being two slits, not one because it's given rise to this interference pattern. How does one atom do that? Does it split in half? Does it become like a, a cloud that goes through both? The path taken by the photon is not an element of reality. We are not allowed to talk about the photon passing through this or this slit. Neither are we allowed to say that the photons pass through both slits. All this kind of language is not applicable. So they further modified the experiment to get to the bottom of the mystery. They put a measuring device at one slit to see which one the particle actually went through. But when the electrons were being this closely observed, they went back to behaving like little objects and produced a clump pattern, not an interference pattern. Somehow, the act of observation meant that they only went through one slit, not both. The electrons seem to decide how to behave as if they were aware of being watched. How could this possibly be the case? Could the presence of a conscious observer be influencing the experiment? In 1978, physicist John Wheeler proposed a new way of doing the double slit experiment that might finally reveal what's really happening. He proposed what is called the delayed choice experiment in which the decision of whether or not to observe the particles isn't made until after they've gone through the slits, but before they've impacted the detector. This animation is highly simplified, but you get the idea. Here comes the light. It travels through the double slit barrier as waves. The waves are past the slits, but haven't yet hit the detector. And here comes the scientist. His eyes are closed. 
he's delaying his choice to make this an observed experiment and then The results of the experiment didn't solve the mystery. Instead, it got even stranger. Because what was found was that at the moment of decision to observe, the waves became particles. And not only that, but they actually made a record of themselves as having traveled through the slits as particles. Yes, you heard me. Deciding to run the observed experiment causes the waves to become particles, and this causal force extends backwards in time. What? Our choice of what experiment to do determines the prior state of the electron. Running the experiment unobserved does not cause this effect. The observer affects the outcome. You, by perceiving it, affect reality. Can you grasp the levity of this concept? This is no longer speculation. It has been proven over and over through many different kinds of tests. It is scientific fact and it changes everything. This means that the universe is somehow watching us. It is cognizant of our actions and creates the outcome based on our observation, or intention, or even will. This means that in a chicken and the egg kind of way, we don't exist because of the universe. Rather, it exists because of us. I know that it's hard to wrap your mind around or embrace this idea, as it is radically different from what you were taught. But it's time you try because it's happening, regardless of if you want to believe it or not. It's possible that nothing exists until we look at it. And this is how computer simulated worlds work. The system only renders the simulation around the user. The computer doesn't have to render things that aren't being observed. And this idea is death nails for the materialist worldview. It is just not reconcilable in a naturalist way of perceiving reality. It is, however, not only reconcilable in the simulated reality model, it fits it perfectly. It is concisely how computers work and exactly what we would expect to find if we were in a simulation. To such an extent that science is being dragged kicking and screaming to this conclusion. The next hint at the existence of a matrix can be arrived at from the maximum speed in the universe, the speed of light. Einstein explained that nothing could move faster than photons in a vacuum. The speed of light is a limit and a constant. Additionally, the faster an object moves, the more time slows for that object. At a speed of 300,000 kilometers per second, time stops altogether. That is, you could get to distant galaxies, let's say 3 billion light years away, in the blink of an eye on a spacecraft that had such a speed, according to your time, of course. Those same 3 billion years would pass for a terrestrial observer. So time for a photon stands at zero. It cannot accelerate faster. For this, it would have to slow down time even more, which is impossible as time has already stopped. But why do speed and time have such a relationship? Why are space and time interrelated? The answer suggests a virtual world. The matrix hypothesis assumes that the speed of light is a product of information processing. That is, the world is being updated at a certain rate. It's a trillion times faster than any of our supercomputers now. But the principle is the same. Time slows down with an increase in speed. Because virtual reality depends on virtual time, each processing cycle is one tick. When the computer slows, the playing time also slows down a bit. This is very similar to the way in our world that time slows down with increasing speed or near to massive objects, which points to the possible virtuality of our universe. 
I have always struggled with the theory of relativity. It's big and confusing and has a lot of moving parts, but the simulation hypothesis has even helped this make sense to me. The idea that time would somehow function differently for something traveling the speed of light made no sense. It might not make sense in the material view, but I digress. We've all seen a video game slow down when there is so much happening at once that it exhausts the computer's processing power and causes a lag effect. This could explain why time slows down for something traveling at the speed of light. See, the computer is designed to process things at terrestrial speeds. So if you were on a rocket ship and got up to the speed of light, the computer would then have to render or generate a fully immersive and convincing simulation at light speed. Worlds, stars, whatever you'd be seeing. And thus it may potentially lag or slow down. If before you got on your rocket, you had synced your watch with someone who stayed back on the earth, the watch of the person on the earth wouldn't experience the same effect. All the computer would have to process for them would be you disappearing off into the distance and make a streak if anything. But you'd be experiencing something entirely different and more complex. When you got back to the earth and compared the time that had passed with your earthbound friend, time for you on your rocket adventure would have slowed down due to this processing lag effect, while time for the person who hadn't left the Earth would have remained constant. The most serious proof that we live in a matrix simulation is quantum entanglement. Well, what is it exactly? A photon flying through space can be considered to be rotating. That is, it has something called spin. In fact, photons don't really rotate, but this is a simplified model. So, physicists believe that, most likely, before a particle is observed, it does not even have a specific spin. That is, no one is looking at the photon yet, so it cannot determine which way to turn, and is considered to be in a superposition of uncertainty. It would seem that it's difficult for nature to calculate the rotation of each and every particle, and so it uses a simplified scheme for this. But, again, when an observer appears, the particle becomes physically more complex and more real, and its rotation is calculated. An experiment was proposed by Albert Einstein, which was to test the Copenhagen interpretation for strength. Some very interesting results were obtained from this experiment. The essence of it goes like this. If an atom, for example, cesium, emits two photons in different directions, then because of the law of conservation of momentum, their state will be interconnected. If one of them rotates from the bottom up, then the other will rotate from the top down, always. They will always have spin in opposite directions. This is called quantum entanglement. But remember, the photons do not know which way to spin before they are observed. So in this case, if the fact of observation made one choose one of the options, its tangled partner must then immediately have a spin in the opposite direction. That is, by the very fact of our observation of one photon, we affect the spin of the other photon, even though we did not observe the second photon. And the second photon is required not only to find a spin, but to do so instantly, even if the photons are at a great distance from each other. That means that if the entangled photons were somehow sent even to different ends of the universe, this information about which way it should be spinning should somehow fly or jump across the universe to its partner at several quadrillion times faster than the speed of light, so that it basically instantly gets its spin. This is incredible. It violates the very laws of physics as we know them, because nothing can move faster than photons in a vacuum. However, the second photon still manages somehow to get this information in zero time. But how? How does the partner entangled photon learn with such speed that a colleague was observed and so know to spin in some particular direction? Einstein was convinced that such an instantaneous connection was impossible, and he assumed that when entangled photons emerge from the atom, they already contain information about the past and know which direction they will rotate if or when they are observed. 
That is, the observer does not change things but only recognizes the spin of the particle. But 17 years after Einstein's death, it turned out that this singular, unparalleled genius was mistaken in this case. That's right, Einstein was wrong. To prove the presence or absence of information about the direction in which the particle rotates after observation, Irish physicist John Bell set up a very complex and ingenious experiment. The results were astounding. Bell proved that the entangled particle does not have a clue before it is observed in which direction it will spin. The photon randomly chooses a spin only after measurement. And this is proof that entangled elementary particles can transmit information to each other much faster than the speed of light. The experiment gave us more new questions than answers. In 2008, a group of researchers from the University of Geneva decided to clarify the speed of information exchanged between entangled particles. They were able to separate from each other two entangled photons at a distance of 18 kilometers. They measured one particle and recorded how fast the second reacted to it. The technology they used allowed them to measure a delay time of up to 100,000 times faster than the speed of light. But there wasn't even such a minuscule pause as this. It turned out that, as measured, the photons somehow were able to transmit information at least 100,000 times faster than the speed of light, and maybe even instantly. Perhaps Einstein was right when he said that instant communication in the physical world is impossible. But if we substitute a virtual reality in place of the physical world, the instant connection is easily explained. When two photons become entangled, their programs are combined to jointly see the two points. This combination of programs will respond for both pixels, if we can call them that, no matter where they are. At the moment of measuring one particle, its program randomly chooses one of the spins, and the program of the second immediately reacts. It becomes clear why the distance isn't important. The processor does not need to go to the pixel to ask it to spin, even if the so-called screen is large even as large as a universe. It is vital that we fully understand how this universe, being a virtual construct, finally reconciles the mysterious workings of quantum physics with reality. The results confirmed that non-locality was actually real. What Schrodinger had called entanglement and was defended by Bohr but ridiculed by Einstein was a fundamental property of nature. Instant correspondence can be seen between two particles that are separated by unlimited distance in space, and this only makes sense if the world is a virtual construct. In a virtual world, distance doesn't limit correspondence, since all points in a simulation are equidistant with respect to the source of the simulation. For example, in a computer game, all points on the screen are at equal distance with respect to the processor, and the same effect can be seen in our world. If our universe is a simulation projected onto a three-dimensional screen, then its processor would be equidistant to all points in the universe. Non-locality, one of the biggest problems in physics, is easily solved by the simulation hypothesis. Space seems to be an illusion created by the virtual construct. Quantum entanglement and non-locality are intimidating words with profound implications but are easily explainable and understandable in the simulation hypothesis model. Which is a point I want to make as I close out this nature of reality argument. You'd think that a preponderance of evidence would be sufficient to prove a point, but in this case, it is not. There is something strange about this simulation. Whoever or whatever seems to have made it, seems to have made it in such a way that we are forced to choose or believe what this place is and how it got here. It's like the author is hiding just out of view. It seems like the programmer may have gone to great lengths to remain mostly anonymous. But I want to know, 
who or what is responsible for this thing. And is it possible for us to know who made this? Are there clues or is there maybe even evidence of authorship? So, so are you saying we are all just, there's some entity that programmed the universe and we're just expressions of their code? Okay, well, the, the more interesting aspect to that question is who's the programmer and where's the computer? Before we dive into the potential identity of the programmer discussion, I have to address the she she science approved theories of this being either an ancient ancestry simulation made by super advanced future humans, or that the simulation is made by, you guessed it, aliens. Here's the problem. In order for either of these to have occurred, there would have had to have been a Big Bang type event, where everything comes out of nothing, including the laws of physics and thermodynamics, and then naturalistic planet and stellar formation would have had to have occurred, which science surprisingly doesn't have a great answer for. Then animate objects would have had to arise out of inanimate material then information would have had to have come from a non-information source, i.e. DNA, that macroevolution would have had to have happened, and yada yada yada. But let's be honest about what is behind these theories. Science is so entirely sold out to the Darwinian materialist model that they've been dogmatically following for two centuries, that they've just proposed a couple of theories that circumvent the need for a god or creator type. And not because these ideas make the most sense, but really because they don't want there to be a god. One can only assume that some of their anti-god fervor stems from a general disdain toward religion, which I actually totally get and also have. Maybe some of it has to do with not wanting to be held accountable for their actions, which is understandable. Or maybe they had something terrible happen to them and they can't reconcile how God would have permitted it. Regardless of intent, these kinds of explanations for who programmed this reality are cop-outs. They are circular reasoning at best and logical fallacies at worst. Those of you who can't swim in the philosophical and theological shark-infested waters of world religion might want to go ahead and get out now. Because I'm doing it. I'm going there. I'm willing to go where I have to to look for answers. I mean, if we are in a simulation and humans have been looking up and in and around for answers for thousands of years, you'd like to think that someone got it right, or even close to explaining this place as a virtual reality construct. We need to start at the beginning. Let's look at the origin stories or creation accounts of the world's four major religions to see if any of them are compatible with the digital Big Bang theory. Hopefully you remember it, the idea being the Big Bang actually happened, but the origination source was a computer or something like it that's in another plane of existence. Just to be clear, at this point we are only looking at the validity of their respective origination story as it relates to the simulation hypothesis, not the entire religion as a whole. Skepticism's first opponent, ranked fourth with a world population of 6.9%. Buddhism.
The universe always existing is not compatible with the digital Big Bang Theory. In the simulation hypothesis model, there is a clear beginning. And if you look further into the Buddhist stance on origins, it is not vital to this religion. Buddhists prefer to distance themselves from the subject and would rather lean on the sciences for information relating to the origins of the universe. An understandable stance, but not the kind of clues to authorship that I was looking for. Skepticism's yeah, next opponent, ranking third with a world population of 15%. Hinduism! Before time began, there was no heaven, no earth, no space, just nothing. The waves of vast dark ocean lapped on the edges of this nothingness, and a giant cobra floated in the waters. Lying asleep in the snake's coils was Lord Vishnu, and the snake kept him safe and he slept really peacefully. Slowly, a sound started. Om. It grew louder and filled the emptiness. It throbbed with energy and drove the nothingness away. Lord Vishnu woke up, and a magnificent lotus flower grew from his navel. Right in the middle of the flower sat Brahma. Lord Vishnu told Brahma to set to work and create a world. And still, sitting in the flower, Brahma calmed the wind, stilled the waves and brought peace. Brahma split the lotus flower, making three different parts. The heavens, the earth, and the skies. So there was nothing and waves of a dark ocean lapped against the nothing. Uh, Vishnu was sleeping in a cobra and a flower grew up, whatever. That story is all well and good, but it is also not compatible with the digital origin explanation. Skepticism's Skepticism next opponent, opponent. Ranking, ranking second, second. Accounting, accounting for an impressive, impressive. one fourth of the world's population, is Well, Dan, we've got a good one here today. Skepticism is facing its most challenging opponent yet. The Muslim faith is the fastest growing religion in the world. Don't be surprised to see Islam come out swinging. Allah Azawajal, in the beginning, it was Him as a being and there was nothing else. And there's a hadith in Muslim that says that, that Allah Azawajal was there and there was nothing else besides Him. He wanted others or creation, He wanted a creation to know Him. So He created the creation. So the first thing He created was the pen. Uh, again, there's a hadith in Muslim that the first thing Allah created was the pen and he created the tablet. Now what is the tablet? The tablet is a large piece of stone or something similar to it. And he told the pen to write. And he told it to write everything that would come into existence. Everything of his irada, of his will, whatever he's going to will. And he told it to write everything about the creation, whatever is going to happen. So every minute detail to the last detail was all written on this tablet. And this tablet is something that the ulama of Tafsir, they have debated where this tablet is. And some have said that it's on the fourth heaven, some have said that it's above all the heavens. And then there is a debate whether anyone else apart from Allah has got access to this tablet. Wow, Rick, you were right. Islam really brought it. <laughs> Enough of that. But seriously, if, if you saw that coming, then kudos. That creation account is entirely compatible with the digital Big Bang model. The creator writing on something that looks like a stone tablet, but no one is sure exactly what it is or where it is that existed in another plane of existence. 
programmer planning out all of creation before creating it by writing out the instructions on whatever this tablet is. What you'll see here in a minute is this story is actually a spin-off of an older religious origin model, the Jewish creation account. And it's really not surprising how closely they resemble each other. The Muslim faith began centuries after Judaism. And if you've studied the histories of Islam and the Judeo-Christian religions, you know that their stories have intertwined throughout their existence. And while they share many of the same historical figures and similarities, they are starkly different belief systems and are not compatible. It is clear that the Judeo-Christian God named Yahweh or Jehovah and the Islamic God named Allah are two different beings. I won't go into this right now as it would take time that we don't have, nor is this video the place for it. I will, however, concede that it is entirely possible that the entity we know as Allah could have either been there for the creation of the universe, or was at minimum privy to how it happened. We've now covered all but one of the leading programmer candidates, the last remaining being the Judeo-Christian model. Despite its well-detailed hardships, Judaism is arguably the world's oldest surviving religion dating back 3,500 years and still practiced in much the same way today as it was during its inception. Meanwhile, Christianity, which came from Judaism, is modern day's largest religion. So between the two, we have the oldest and largest faith-based systems. If you are still watching this video, I will assume you can understand the words coming out of my stupid mouth. I will then assume that you speak English, and will lastly assume that you've probably at some point heard the Six Days of Creation account detailed in the book of Genesis. What I doubt you've heard, though, is what the Jewish tradition teaches about what God's speaking creation into existence actually means. It is something that rabbis have taught for millennia, but may actually for the first time make sense in context of the simulation hypothesis. We call the Hebrew language the DNA of creation. What does that mean that the Hebrew language is the DNA of creation? It means like this. The major premise we have as Jews is that Hashem created the world by first creating the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet and the numbers 0 through 9, and by combining letters together, He created the reality of everything that we know. Whoa, wait, we have to hear that again. <laughs> is that Hashem created the world by first creating the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet and the numbers 0 through 9, and by combining letters together, He created the reality of everything that we know. Did you get that? According to this tradition, the Creator first made the Hebrew alphabet and the numbers 0 through 9, and by combining the letters together, he created our reality. This is how computers work. This is how programmers write software code. And the main thing with programming language is to understand is what you're going to be doing is you're going to be taking what is called human readable code. So you actually type out with a text editor or uh, one of these compilers, you type out what you want the code to do. And then that compiler or what's called an interpreter turns that into ones and zeros, ons and offs. That's all the computer cares about. Okay, we all know that computers operate using ones and zeros, but how does a computer take human readable text or alpha characters and turn them into ones and zeros. But how can we do the same thing for letters? We understand numbers can become numbers, but how do we turn letters into binary numbers? Every single key on your keyboard 
has a number associated with it. Every single character that you can type can be translated into a decimal number. For example, the character capital A on your keyboards becomes the number 65. This is a standard and is globally recognised. It's part of the ASCII table. Every letter, every symbol and every number on your keyboard has a corresponding number associated with it. So A is always 65. Computers turn letters into numbers by employing a computer language named ASCII. The American Standard Code for Information Interchange. With this computer language, every character actually represents a number, and that number is then understood by the computer as a series of ones and zeros. And the ancient language of Hebrew works the same way. In Hebrew, every letter has a numerical representation, just like ASCII. That's right. I am proposing that Hebrew is the first computer language, and is, as the rabbis have taught, the precise language that the programmer used to write out the code that creates the simulated reality. Hey! Max! Lenny Meyer! Sorry, I put it out. So... What do you do? <clears throat> um, I work with computers, math. Ma math? What kind of math? N number theory. Research what? mostly. No way, I work with numbers myself. I mean, not traditional. I work with the Torah. <laughs> Amazing! <laughs> Yo, Hebrew's all math. It's all numbers. You know that? Yeah, look. The ancient Jews used Hebrew as their numerical system, eh? Each letter's a number. Like the Hebrew A, Aleph, it's one. B, Bet, it's two. You understand? But look at this. The numbers are interrelated. Like, take the Hebrew word for father. Av, Aleph, Bet. One, two, equals three. All right? Hebrew word for mother, Aim, Aleph, Mem, one, 40 equals 41. Sum of 3 and 41, 44. All right? Now, Hebrew word for child. All right? Mother, father, child. Yelad. That's 10, 30, and 4. 44. Torah is just a long string of numbers. Some say that it's a code sent to us from God. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. So if we are in a computer-generated reality, and Hebrew is the language the program is written in, is it possible the Torah is the software coding? The precisely arranged series of letters that creates our reality. The human-readable text that the computer turns into ones and zeros. The source code. All right, I understand this is an extraordinary claim. And I can only imagine what some of you must be feeling or thinking right now. But this idea has merit. It has scientific, statistically significant support. And is in fact not a new idea. It's just new to us. And therefore today, humanity is coming back again and again to that same perception that our world is merely a certain kind of a relatively small reality among different other existing forms, if not in matter, then in potential, if not in potential, then like in the brain or in computers, that we're a kind of an expression of a certain program 
that the whole of reality is a program. In short, there is much to say about it, and much will be said about it in the future. But according to the wisdom of Kabbalah, which is my profession, on behalf of which I can speak, the Torah, it's called the general program for operating the whole of reality. The Torah, it's called the general program for operating the whole of reality. This understanding of the relationship between the Torah and creation is not a new concept to rabbis in the know. It is actually the esoteric manner in which Kabbalah has explained the workings of reality for centuries. And it predates the concept of computers or a simulation by such a significant amount of time that if you are being honest, you have to surrender a level of validity to it. While some of history's great philosophers have dabbled with ideas in this vein, obviously from a perspective of logic or reason, the Jewish people had to accept this information on faith. Their God told them that this was the nature of our reality and they have held on to this tradition since that time. Look, I know that this is a huge leap, and that the Hebrew alphabet having a numerical value, of Jewish mystics teaching for centuries, that we are in a simulation that was created by using the Torah as the program or operating system, isn't enough to validate the notion that the Torah is the coding that creates this virtual reality. So is there any other evidence that might substantiate this remarkable claim? Well, the most compelling clue is also the most controversial. It is a centuries-old and fiercely debated phenomenon known as the Bible Code or the Torah Code. For billions of people, the Bible is the most important book ever written. But what if there is more to its message than the written word? A code hidden deep within the Bible's text. These things were secret. The idea of hidden codes in the Bible was something you didn't speak about. Now, are these secrets finally coming to light? If the codes are real, it would be completely mind-blowing. Every major event in world history, every major figure in world history appears to be encoded in the Bible. I believe the Bible code issue is nonsense from beginning to end. The overwhelming majority of scientists who have studied the phenomenon have come to the conclusion that there's no basis for it whatever. All my instincts as a scientist and also as a Jew spoke against the possibility of such a phenomenon. Yet despite this, the work of Whitsum, Rips and Rosenberg presents a very strong scientific evidence that under intense scientific experimentation the phenomenon is shown to exist. Close examination of this evidence shows it to be completely subjective and arbitrary, completely reliant on faith in the honesty of the people who did it, and that disqualifies it as being scientific evidence. We could watch clips and read articles both for and against the Torah codes for hours. It is understandably a very divisive topic. If it's true, then it pretty much proves that the author of the Torah is outside of time and space and has infinite resources. If it's fraudulent, then it should be discounted entirely and all the negative sentiment it garners is justified. What is the Torah Code? It is a secondary layer of information encoded in the primary readable text of the Torah. Information that some claim details much of, if not the entire history of this reality. And what is the Torah? It is the five books given to Moses by God on Mount Sinai 3,300 years ago. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. An important distinction between these books and other canon in scripture is that while other books were written by men that were reportedly inspired by God, tradition states that these five books were actually written by God. Well, technically, God sequentially dictated each letter to Moses, who transcribed this information into the scrolls that made up the original Torah. 
This letter-by-letter -letter dictation is the practice that highly trained scribes have used from that time into modernity. There are in fact more than 20 very strict procedures that scribes are mandated to adhere to when copying the Torah, including a dire warning which states that if even one letter is added or removed during copying, this action could cause the destruction of the entire universe. While this was a sobering and ominous dictate and was vital in preserving the accuracy of the original text, is it possible that this warning was actually referring to corrupted software coding? Where the Torah came from and how it was accurately preserved over time was important for us to cover as it deservedly comes up when discussing the legitimacy of the Bible code. Often, when first hearing of the code, the initial response is, Then the next is the Bible has had so many translations and has changed so much over its history that there is no way that the code could work. Well, researchers agree that the code is only truly valid if it is done in the original Hebrew and that version of the Torah is remarkably close to what Moses brought down from Mount Sinai. How does the code work? While it is entirely possible that there are multiple layers or dimensions to this coding that have yet to be discovered, the code that has been found is in a format known as an equidistant letter skip code, or ELS code. ELS codes work by skipping equal letter intervals in a text to reveal new information. By using this technique, thousands of codes in the Torah have been uncovered information that describes in detail events that have occurred throughout man's history. Information pertaining to things that occurred after the Torah was written. The great Jewish sage, the Vilna Gaon, who lived in the 18th century and studied the code phenomenon throughout his life, was quoted as saying, everything that has ever been or ever will be is encoded in the Torah. Isaac Newton, the grandfather of modern science, who was totally mesmerized and consumed by the codes, went as far as to say that the entire universe is encoded in the Torah. While I highly encourage you to research the codes and the information they have uncovered, I am going to cover two of my favorites and then we need to move on. The first is in what code researchers refer to as a table which just means a cluster of related codes in a small area. A lot of times, they are found inside a section of the Torah that on the surface text is also relevant to the coded information, which is totally the case here. In the book of Numbers, chapter 20, Moses is instructed by God to tell the rock at Horeb to bring forth water in order to meet the needs of the Hebrew people wandering the desert. But Moses, who had a temper, disobeyed God and struck the rock with his staff. And not just once, but twice. What event do you suppose is found encoded intersecting this text? is the finding of the twin towers attack, the attack of the planes on the towers, the twin towers. And here we can see this finding, but let us see this cover, you can see here, the word mitkefet, which is right in the down, you go here, mem, or mitkefet, mem, taf, kuf, pei, taf, which is attack, mitkefet, atkef, very close to English, attack, atkif, atkef, mitkefet, and Migdale, you can see here Migdale, the towers of Atomim twins, the twin towers, and a deck. And here you have the Matos, the word Matos in Hebrew plain. So in this area, which happened to be the story in the Torah in, in numbers about taking the stick, you can see Moses took the stick and was hitting the rock, here is the Sela rock, twice. So hitting the rock twice coming exactly with the story of the planes we hit the Twin Towers twice. The amount of accurate, applicable information related to 9-11 found in this small area with an appropriately themed topical text is truly phenomenal. 
the probability of this table occurring by chance is less than 1 in 10 million. The second example that I want you to see shows the multi-dimensional nature of the coding. While most research in this field only looks for codes utilizing the equidistant letter skip method, look at the profound manner in which the information in this table is encoded. Supporters say one of the latest revelations of the code concerns the event that took place on February 1st, 2003, the Space Shuttle Columbia disaster. Start with a find from Professor Ripps about Space Shuttle Columbia. Columbia, they will mourn a devouring fire. Professor Ripps did not see this red ELS. He showed it to a friend who immediately said, this looks like a space shuttle. What, what if there was something interesting on this other wing? And it's facing down, so this must be the left wing. And sure enough, it says, consumed by fire. This layout shows that there are potentially unlimited ways that the information may be encoded in the Torah. In fact, computer science is looking intensely into ways for data to be stored in the multidimensional fashion of DNA. A lot of what geneticists used to refer to as junk DNA was actually just information arranged in a way that wasn't recognized initially. And this could be exactly what we are looking at with the information in the Torah. So why is the information in there? And what does it mean? Are we all just playing out some predetermined cosmic script? Is the programmer using a parlor trick to try and impress the users? Or does the presence of the code quantum physically explain how this system is a truly self-determining free will simulation? Scientific evidence, hard scientific evidence, the consciousness itself could not, it not only create the reality around us, but what it's doing is, as you're observing the reality around you, you're collapsing something called the wave, the wave function, which is um, a probability wave. And the act of observation collapses that probability wave into a reality that could be one of a myriad of realities. It's rather similar if you're playing the first-person computer game. You know, in, in my generation, it was very much Lara Croft and Tomb Raider. Effectively, Lara Croft on the screen has a myriad of, of opportunities within her life, within the game, because every opportunity and every decision she makes or the game player makes is programmed within the, the, the hard drive of the computer or within the CD-ROM. Imagine a universe like that. And again, this is not crazy stuff. Um, the, the, there was a paper published, I think, in 2007 or 2008 by Stephen Hawking and his associate Thomas Hertog from CERN. And they have something called the top-down hypothesis of particle physics. And again, this is Stephen Hawking, one of the world's leading theoretical physicists. And his model suggests that literally every outcome of every decision is already digitally programmed within something. And by our act of observation and by our choices, we collapse that particular reality. Even Brendan McKay, the world's most outspoken Bible Code critic, concedes that information pertaining to events that have already happened are found encoded in the Torah. The problem occurs when someone looks to the code for some yet-to-happen future event and claims to find it. From the Da Vinci Code to the Bible Code, there's always been mystery surrounding hidden messages in some historical articles. But are these codes real, or just a great way of getting to the top of the bestsellers list? Well, luckily we have mathematician Brendan McKay with us here today to help us sort it out. G'day Brendan, how are you? Hi John. Now, first of all, what are these codes and are they real? Well, that's a good question. The, <laughs> the claim is that if you analyse the text of the Bible in 
the original language, which is Hebrew, and use a computer in a particular way, you can detect hidden messages inside it concerning the future. Huh. And so, what were they saying, and are they real? Well, there's a number of different claims. One of the claims is that there are messages concerning the current time, and things that might happen, uh, earthquakes, uh, assassinations, future calamities that await mankind. So these are quite specific things that they say? Yeah. Places, times, dates, details, yes. So have any of these things actually happened? No. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the first thing, these things actually haven't happened. Well, you know, it depends exactly what you mean, because after the thing actually happened, you can go back and find the prediction there. Ah. But did you find it before it actually happened or only after? This is an important point to make. The reason you can't use the code to try to predict a predetermined, written in stone future event is that information in the Torah creates the opportunity for all outcomes. And this is what the Torah code is. It is a glance into the potential outcomes that are encoded into the source code. It's okay. It's okay. The subject of this speech is a topic which has been discovered recently and which may not exist at all. I may be talking about something that does not exist. Therefore, I'm free to say everything or nothing. I know of no one who has ever made this claim before. We are living in a computer programmed reality. Well, maybe we're in a simulation right now. Yeah. <laughs> Can I be sure that this mathematical reality isn't actually some kind of game or, or simulation? I personally find that I gravitate more towards the information theoretic point of view and, and believing that, uh, that I'm, I, the universe that I exist in is a very good, high quality simulation. Are you saying we are all just, there's some entity that programmed the universe and we're just expressions of their code? The Torah is just a long string of numbers. Some say that it's a code sent to us from God. The Torah, it's called the general program for operating the whole of reality. Time to restate my assumptions. One, we are living in a simulated reality. Two, the simulation is being generated from a computer that is in a different plane of existence. Three, this computer functions using a program, a program that operates by using an alphanumeric based software code. Four, the ancient Semitic language of Hebrew is the language the computer code is written in. Five, the 3300 year old manuscript, the Torah, is the string of letters and numbers that generates this reality. It is the code. Lost, or at least overlooked in the complexity and brilliance of the machine we are in, is the nearly incomprehensible gift of free will. The ability to love who we want, live where we want, do what we want, even eat what we want, and it is totally taken for granted. So what is this place? It is a fully immersive choose your own adventure novel, a free will simulation made by a mind so brilliant and so far advanced from what we are that it is hard to comprehend. A mind that in its unlimited capacity decided to make us, to make this for us.
Johnson. 